Hello and welcome to Press TV News Analysis. I'm Kaveh Tafoyi. Just last spring, Myanmar was boasting of democracy to the world. But now, a month after activist Aung San Suu Kyi received the Nobel Peace Prize, an alarm bell is going off. A program against the population of Muslims called the Rohingyas began in June, which has been called an ethnic cleansing of the Muslim population. Why hasn't this received more international coverage? Certainly, Myanmar has become an example of democracy as deemed recently by the United States, the European Union, and Canada. On this news analysis, we will examine why the Rohingya Muslims, as they are called, are facing this fate as Myanmar's president, Tan Chan, says Rohingya Muslims must be expelled from the country and sent to refugee camps run by the United Nations, who have in turn refused them. Their country rejects them. No other country wants them. This is the plight of nearly 800,000 Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. And to add insult to injury, Myanmar's president has come up with a new solution. Tianjin says Rohingya Muslims must be expelled and sent to refugee camps run by the United Nations. He has even topped his last solution with deportation as the ultimate solution. But where to go? Large groups of Rohingya Muslims have already sailed to neighboring Bangladesh with many dying in the exodus. The Bangladeshi government considers them illegal migrants and deports them. And the UN Refugee Center says it will not help Rohingya Muslims as it is not interested in creating more refugees. Last month, at least 80 people were killed in ethnic clashes in western Rakhine. The violence erupted following the rape and killing late May of a Buddhist woman. The police reportedly detained three Muslims. Cruelty towards the Rohingyas is nothing new. They have faced torture, neglect and repression in the Buddhist majority land since it achieved independence in 1948. But why are they mistreated? Uh, and given this sort of treatment is for two reasons. One is the fact that they are on the racist sort of concept. These are not the same race as the race of Burmese. And on the second part, they're actually Muslim and, you know, uh, they're being targeted for both of those reasons. According to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, state security forces have destroyed thousands of their homes and conducted mass arrests of Muslims. Some analysts believe a state-supported ethnic cleansing is underway in Myanmar. We are seeing sort of the same thing that happened in Bosnia. I mean, only a um, couple of days ago was the anniversary of Srebrenica. And we are seeing the same uh, policies now being implemented, not in Europe now, but in Burma. Strangely enough, the country's democratic icon and Nobel Peace laureate Aung San Suu Kyi has also failed to speak out against the atrocities. So what can be done to ease the sufferings of Rohingya's Muslims? Some analysts believe the least possible is to pile pressure on Myanmar's rulers to settle the even uglier side of its domestic policies. We need to uh, put pressure on this new government uh, which is going around and uh, sort of um, uh, promoting itself as democratic and, uh, and, and uh, a government that is based on empowering of its own people to first of all recognize all its citizens, including Rohingyas, and uh, then stop the military in uh, implementing this ethnic cleansing. Well, let's talk about this with our guests. Let me introduce some author and Islamic studies expert Kevin Barrett joins us from Madison. We have Professor at the Shahid Zulfaqar Ali Bhutto Institute of Science and Technology, Ghulam Tari Bangash, joining us from Islamabad, and spokesman of the Islamic Human Rights Commission, Raza Kazim, joins us from London. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, Professor uh, Bangash, let me first start with you. Uh, perhaps you can give us a history fact check. Who are the Rohingya Muslims, since perhaps many are not aware of them? And if you could tell us about their past. Yeah. And also the fact that they have been marginalized for some time now. Yes, uh, they uh, actually uh, historically they belong to uh, three different countries. Uh, some uh, came from China, some from uh, very old time from uh, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, some from uh, another th a third country. But uh, that is history. And uh, now the stand uh, is such that you see. Uh, they, they are being uh, uh, eliminated. Uh, this ethnic cleansing is absolutely an international tragedy. And actually this has been going on for the last uh, 30 years, but uh, nobody knew about it. The uh, persecution was there, but it was not of such a, uh, uh, a huge scale a as it is now. 
And now the problem is that the government uh, says that uh, these people do not belong to uh, um, Myanmar. And this is something which is not acceptable. And it is an international tragedy. It is something that is th those people belong to uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, and uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, they, they say that they are Bangladeshis. This is absolutely incorrect. A part of them are, uh, were Bangladeshis in the sense that, well, they were not Bangladeshis, they were Pakistanis in the real sense uh, when we go back to history. Uh, before uh, the uh, independence of uh, Myanmar in 1948. Uh, so uh, this is absolutely incorrect that they are outsiders, that they must be thrown out. This is ethnic cleansing and the Myanmar government is lucky in the sense that uh, the Muslim world, uh, majority of the Muslim peoples around the globe do not know about this tragedy. You see, we in Pakistan, for example, have always respected and always, you see, treasured. We feel proud of the Buddhist traditions in Pakistan. Right here, uh, you know, in the suburban area of Islamabad, we have uh, a huge, you see, Buddhist civilization monasteries and uh, all Buddhists are welcome to Pakistan and every year, you know, uh, people from around the Buddhist world come here. But this is very strange. It's a paradox for me to know that the uh, Buddhists who uh, were historically so peaceful people, they were non-violent, most of their history is so non-violent and now suddenly this is a huge uh, shock, it's a catastrophe uh, and not owning them, that is the government and even this uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, the lady is so uh, uh, criminally silent about uh, the uh, uh, problems of this uh, uh, the, this minority uh, uh, in uh, Myanmar, and this is not acceptable. And the more uh, Muslims know about it uh, around the globe, uh, the more uh, the, there will be problems for the uh, Myanmar government. And, well, let me uh, let me bring in uh, Kevin Barrett uh, here. Uh, thank you for that, Kevin Barrett. Uh, it's alarming on two fronts. What our guest there said, uh, basically that a this has been going on for quite some time and that be that it has escalated to the point that it has been called an ethnic cleansing brings about the immediate question where has the international community been and the respective international organizations well uh, the unfortunate answer is that the international community has been uh, absent without leave they've been looking the other way and in fact the international community led by the West and led by the United States of America has been pouring more and more investment into Myanmar even as this horif horrific ethnic cleansing unfolds and gets worse and worse by the day uh, what's being done uh, to these people is essentially the same thing that the Nazi Germans did to Jews and gypsies, the same thing that the Zionists did to the Palestinians, the same thing that was being done to the Bosnians in the 1990s. This is ethnic cleansing, uh, arguably genocide. Uh, these people have nowhere else to go. And the idea that a modern government today can say that people who've been living in that country for centuries are not citizens because they have the wrong religion or the wrong ethnicity is uh, a catastrophe. If that's allowed to stand and if other countries begin trying to throw out groups of people who've been living in their countries for centuries because they're the wrong religion or ethnicity, the whole planet <laughs> would collapse into an orgy of bloodshed and violence and ethnic cleansing and genocide and that cannot be allowed to happen. So we need to wake up the world uh, to this situation and we need to get the human rights groups involved and we need to get the Islamic world involved because these are our Muslim brothers and sisters who are being ruthlessly persecuted. There have been thousands killed. Uh, there have been dozens and dozens of mosques burned down. There have been many thousands of houses burned down and corpses are washing up in the river at the border of Bangladesh every day and yet the world does nothing. And we're looking at uh, about a million and a half uh, roughly uh, of these Muslims uh, that has been ordered by uh, the president of Myanmar to be sent to refugee camps. Uh, Raza Kazim, it, this is a severe decision by the president, Thein Sein, isn't it? It is quite a shocking decision and again I would like to reiterate that what uh, the silence of Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, quite deafening 
and quite problematic that uh, uh, considering that she's going around promoting uh, promoting herself and being promoted as the beacon of democracy that she has been so silent on this particular issue and it is worrying that what kind of a democracy and what kind of a uh, world uh, Myanmar is going to become um, and also with, with regards to this uh, I understand that we you had the um, ambassador of Bangladesh to Britain um, uh, on, earlier on and he was saying that a lot of these people who are being turned away at the borders of Bangladesh are those that are criminals and terrorists and so on and so forth we've heard this kind of language before and on the other hand they're talking about this idea that uh, if they're uh, taken into Bangladesh that this will encourage the ethnic cleansing to actually take place and I think uh, it is shocking that at a time when uh, the attacks on the Rohingya Muslim community have uh, gone up significantly um, that this is something that is continuing and I would beg to differ slightly with uh, one of my earlier guests um, th this is something that isn't new you know the, the attacks uh, you know date back to you know have been dated back to the 18th century and this kind of uh, tension and this kind of um, uh, the attacks on the Rohingya Muslims have been going on for some time and we need to remember that um, a lot of these people um, have actually had uh, no kind of arms or any way of resisting uh, the oppression that's being meted out to them um, you, know, w you know whereas in Palestine for example you've got the situation that people have got uh, a means of resisting um, with arms uh, the Israeli occupation and uh, the Israeli barrage this is something that is not an option that's available uh, to these Rohingya uh, Muslims and they are uh, uh, you know in some senses a sitting duck and it is shocking that the world has been silent and has been selective um, in terms of what uh, which kind of people they are prepared to promote in terms of getting rights but these people who have been who have had this problem meted out to them for such a long time and this situation has escalated uh, in recent years quite considerably nothing is actually being done about it uh, Professor Bangash, uh, every fact that not only you have presented but our uh, previous two guests have uh, presented brings up the uh, simple question, why? Why has this happened? Why has this been going on for such time? And why, for example, doesn't the UN want to accept them? Isn't this their job? Is, uh, it's odd for them uh, not to uh, want to serve these refugees, for example, and in addition, not to put efforts as to accommodate them otherwise. I mean, they, uh, it just seems uh, very strange, uh, the whole situation, and then for, for example, the UN to react this way. Yes. Um, uh, you see, the problem is that uh, uh, Southeast Asia is becoming uh, much more uh, conspicuous on the economic map uh, of, uh, for the United States of America. Uh, the Americans uh, actually uh, want to coax them, uh, the, 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 not only uh, Myanmar, but uh, uh, the other countries, uh, that is uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Laos, all these countries, uh, so that they do not uh, have better relations with People's Republic of China. Uh, so that, that is a part of the problem. And uh, 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 recently, the uh, American Secretary of State uh, has you see um, uh, the sanction issue uh, you know it's uh, they, they should have uh, rather strengthened the s sanctions against Myanmar un until this problem would, uh, should be solved but they are not doing that they want to have that is Americans want to have more uh, better uh, military ties uh, with the government which uh, the international and uh, you know the journalist community including uh, your good self uh, very much know uh, that uh, the election was not fair. Uh, of course, uh, there are internal problems, other problems uh, that is uh, which contribute. Uh, that is, the country, the system is uh, uh, actually antiquated. It is uh, very old, uh, including the banking system and uh, the uh, labor community, uh, the economic, uh, you see, uh, and then uh, isolation uh, uh, and all those uh, added to the miseries of uh, uh, the different communities in Myanmar, including uh, uh, Buddhists and uh, uh, the uh, Muslims. But this does not mean, you see, that uh, uh, one should be 
so uh, so criminally silent uh, about uh, the plight of this uh, ethnic uh, ethnic cleansing now the situation is that uh, you see uh, um, the more and more people because the journalist community although it is not uh, uh, as uh, free as it should be uh, but uh, now at least they can write although they are punished and several uh, uh, cases uh, uh, have been lodged against them uh, in the courts but uh, still uh, now the situation for the journalist community is better in Myanmar so in coming days uh, what uh, uh, I can predict is that more and more uh, Muslims uh, around the world will know about this and the situation can uh, become uh, very grave uh, for us in Pakistan if the Pakistani public knows about uh, uh, all this so there will be problems for Myanmar uh, and there will be problem for you know because that is something which uh, 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 we do not want right uh, because well, we have, uh, since, uh, since we're running uh, quickly out of time I've got to bring in Kevin Bar uh, Barrett here Kevin Barrett uh, you mentioned the United States. Other guests also mentioned that. Is there agenda by the United States here? It is kind of odd, isn't it? Uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, from what I uh, have uh, understood, has not made any uh, references to this. But a uh, lot of hype about uh, Wall Street companies investing in Myanmar. IMF is going to set up uh, an office there. What is going on here? Why is there not a mention on this? Well, that's, the, that's a great question. Uh, as the other guest said, this problem has been going on for centuries, but uh, we haven't had, it hasn't happened before that the president has stood up and said that these people are not citizens and never can be citizens. That's, a, that's an outrageous statement. It's an unacceptable statement. And one would think that the leaders of all nations that claim to care about human rights would, would stand up and say, that's unacceptable, you can't do that. Uh, we're going to put on sanctions if you're, if you're going to be uh, running your country that way. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't sound like there's been any such message delivered to Myanmar. On the contrary, the American authorities led by uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, these folks are, are just running around the globe uh, trying to be bigger and bigger hypocrites every day, it seems, uh, preaching about human rights out of one side of their mouths and then when it's inconvenient to their geostrategic goals or their pocketbooks, uh, keeping quiet in situations that are vastly worse than the places that they're preaching about. So it's a, it's a very sad situation. And I think it really shows the need for Muslims to take the lead in human rights. Muslims are being, uh, we're in the lead in being persecuted all over the world. Uh, as Samuel Huntington said, the Islamic world has bloody borders, and that's because the non-Muslim world on the borders of the Muslim world ha is pillaging <laughs> the Muslim world because the Muslim world is so weak. And in that situation, we need to get our act together in communications and journalism and uh, human rights and wage uh, jihad by the tongue for all human rights, not only human rights of persecuted Muslims, but we should be taking the human rights lead in all areas of human rights uh, because the Western powers are forfeiting that, and uh, we may as well move into the vacuum. Raza Kazim, Western powers are forfeiting that. That's what our guest said, and uh, we have mentioned the United States. There are people that are being washed ashore, dead, because they're trying to cross the border, we're talking about close to one and a half million Muslims. It, does the United States think they could just uh, turn the other way uh, as they're uh, parading around the globe, as our guest mentioned there, trying to get investment going into this country? I mean, it, it, is, this, is this what the U.S. is going to do? I mean, there's got to be another way for this situation to be dealt with by the U.S. and by the EU, not to mention Canada, who have entertained Myanmar recently. I think one of the things that we need to remember is three days ago was the uh, anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre and at that time this is precisely what was done where uh, the NATO forces actually looked the other way and the Dutch forces actually sent the, uh, the men and the boys out to be killed and so on in, um, at Srebrenica and I think it's something that we need to remember that the West, uh, the Western powers in terms of NATO, in terms of what America has done etc um, are, uh, are quite, have done this before and uh, is something that uh, is quite capable of doing again for their 
uh, interest as it has already been pointed out. And I think we need to remember that there needs to be uh, quite clear-cut ideas about how we're going to actually raise the profile of um, what's actually going on so that we're not just appealing um, to the conscience of the Muslim countries and the, or the Muslim governments, because many Muslim governments uh, you know, are, are in the pockets of the Americans and so on. And what we need to actually look at is reach beyond that to the Muslim people. And I would actually say when, when a case of uh, humanity actually comes out, it isn't somehow that only the Muslim people need to look at this and think there's a problem here. Every person, or every human being who has a conscience actually needs to think about how can I allow this and other Srebrenica or this kind of ethnic cleansing to actually take place. We know that, for example, in 1997 and nine, or around 98, we had a book uh, being published in, um, so by the name of in fear of our race disappearing and this created the climate where this kind of fear um, uh, had promoted the attacks on the Rohingya Muslims. We've had further statements as has been said by the previous state, uh, speaker by the president who is again talking about um, uh, making these people not as someone who are from this particular area. So the climate is being created and we need to make sure that people like Aung San Suu Kyi who is supposed to be promoting democracy actually is pressure is being put on her by all human rights organizations by people from all over the world to say actually the your Nobel Peace Prize is worth nothing if you don't actually do something um, about and speak against what's going on in your country. It's no good promoting human rights for one group of people and uh, at the expense of another group of people in your country who are natives of that country and have been so for centuries. It is uh, criminal and it is something that uh, we really need to keep on saying that how is it that we're going to progress through this. And a lot of pressure needs to be brought to bear on um, people within the countries, within the ambassadors um, that are present, the Myanmar ambassadors in different countries, and say that this is something that is clearly unacceptable, and this is something that needs to be reversed, otherwise the sanctions that we, uh, you know, have been on that country for some time need to continue. You know, we've, t we've had in Britain, for example, um, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, actually talking about reducing and making, sh working with the, uh, uh, the Myanmar government and trying to move things forward with uh, giving the Aung San Suu Kyi the red carpet treatment in this country. Again, we need to think about what, um, how we can make sure that the pressure builds up in each of our respective countries to make sure that these kind of things do not go unnoticed and people are prepared to campaign. And with regards to that, I would encourage people to make sure that they are writing and uh, putting the relevant kind of pressure on uh, these organizations. Uh, on, on these countries, on the um, politicians in their countries, on the institutions in their countries, to not do business with Myanmar while this kind of thing actually continues. A tragedy unfolding uh, right before our eyes. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Let me thank our guests. Author and Islamic Studies expert Kevin Barrett from Madison, Professor at the Shahid Zulfaqar Ali Bhutto Institute of Science and Technology, Walam Taghi Bangash from Islamabad, and spokesman of the Islamic Human Rights Commission, Raza Kazim there from London. And thank you for watching another edition of the Press TV News Analysis. Tell us what you think. Do send us the comments to newsroom at press TV.ir. From Akavit Hawaii and the entire team here in the capital, Tehran, it's goodbye.